Okay, so this is a second podcast where I'm going to do question two of the January 2012 1004-1601 paper. And first thing to notice is this is an either or question, either do part A or part B. I'm going to do both, but uh, you only need to do one part, so make sure you read the rubric. It says in both parts, we need the formula for the energy levels of the hydrogen atom. And for part A that I'm going to do now, it gives us the equation for the calculated Rydberg constant involving the reduced mass here. And of course, the equation for our infinity, where we assume the electrons infinitely heavier than the nucleus, which has the mass of the electron. And so the first question says, N equals 5 to 4 transition in helium plus is observed at this wavelength, 1012.66 nanometers. Determine an experimental value for the helium Rydberg constant in reciprocal centimeters. And there's a little clue here. Remember to include the charge on the nucleus of the helium ion. So that's part A1. And let's write down the equation we're going to use. So the wave number of the transition is minus the Rydberg constant. Remembering that now we're talking about a one electron atom that has a nuclear charge of greater than one. So we've got to include the charge on the nucleus. And then, of course, our standard 1 over n2 squared minus 1 over n1 squared. We're given the fact that we're trying to find the Rydberg constant. We're doing this for helium plus a nucleus with a 2 plus charge and a negative electron here. So the charge on the nucleus is 2. So that's got to be a 2 squared there. We're told about the transition, which is 5 to 4. So we've got everything we need on the right-hand side. What, of course, we need is the wave number of the transition. And we're given the wavelength, which is 1012.66 nanometers. So we've got to turn that into a wave number. Again, usually we do this in reciprocal centimeters. So let's turn this into something more useful. So that's 1012.66 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. Nanometers 10 to the minus 9 meters. And so that's going to be 100 more centimeters. So 1012.66 times 10 to the minus 7 centimeters. I can say that my wave number is 1 over the wavelength which is going to be 1 over 1012.66 times 10 to the minus 7, which when I put that in my calculator, I get something like 9875, which will now be in reciprocal centimetres. I can take that value in here and solve the equation. So let's do that. So I've got 9875 now equals minus RHE 2 squared 1 over 25 minus 1 over 16. And when I rearrange and solve that equation, I get that the Rydberg constant for helium is 109.722 reciprocal centimetres. I've made it very clear. I've written down all my working. So imagine I'd made a silly numerical mistake. I'd lose one mark for getting the answer wrong, but it's quite clear I knew what I was doing. I was doing the right thing. Okay, so laying out your working nice and clearly so the examiner can see what you're doing is very important. What are we asked to do next? We're asked to explain why RHE, the Rydberg constant for helium, is smaller than the R infinity, but larger than RH for three marks. And of course, that's all just to do with the mass of the nucleus. We're asked why the Rydberg constant for helium is bigger than the Rydberg constant for hydrogen, but smaller than R infinity. Something like the differences in the size of the Rydberg constants depend on the reduced mass of the system. R infinity would be the value of the Rydberg constant if the nucleus was infinitely heavier than the electron. In helium, the nucleus is heavier than that of hydrogen, so the reduced mass of helium is bigger than the reduced mass of hydrogen, so the Rydberg constant of helium is bigger than that of hydrogen. However, the nucleus is not infinitely heavier than the electron. That means the Rydberg constant R infinity is bigger than RHE. Pretty wordy description there, but that certainly gets all the points that we needed for that part, explaining why the Rydberg constant for helium is smaller than that R infinity, but larger than RH. Okay, so the next bit says we've got a mass of the helium nucleus of four proton masses. It tells us the proton mass is 1836 times the mass of the electron. Determine the reduced mass for the helium ion in terms of Me. No, it doesn't want an absolute number. And show that then for helium plus, the calculated value of the Rydberg constant is that same constant times R infinity. We're doing part three here. So, of course, we need that the reduced mass is the mass of the nucleus times the mass of the electron, mass of the nucleus plus Me. 
And we're told that the mass of the nucleus here is four photon masses, which of course is four times 1836 times Me. So we can substitute that into our equation for the reduced mass here. And so we have four times 1836 times Me. So that's the mass of the nucleus times Me. So we've got mass of the nucleus times the mass of the electron here divided by the mass of the nucleus, 4 times 1836 Me plus Me. So when I work out those numbers, we get 7344 mass of the electron squared, divided by 7345 mass of the electron. And of course, we can cancel the squared with that mass of the electron, and we get 7344 divided by 7345 Me. When I put those numbers in my calculators, I get what the question said. I get 0.999864 Me. So there's the reduced mass in terms of the mass of the electron. And the next part of the question says, show that for the helium plus iron, the calculated value of the Rydberg constant is that same number times R infinity. So let's do that. We're given that R calc is e to the 4 times the reduced mass divided by 8 epsilon naught squared h cube c. So we can stick in our value for the reduced mass here. This tells us that R helium calculated is going to be e to the 4 0.999864 me divided by 8 epsilon naught squared h cube c. What we can notice is that this bit here is all R infinity. And so what we've already done is we've shown that R calc for helium is 0.999864 times R infinity, as we are asked to do. Nice and straightforward. Expressing everything in terms of the mass of the electron means you don't have to work out all the constants. Really nice and easy. Part 4 says, use your value from 1 to calculate the energy in EV required to ionize helium from both n equals 2 and n equals 3. Comment on the relative values of your answers. So this is IV, and what we're asked for is the ionization energy, let's call that IE, from n equals 2 and n equals 3. And of course, we remember we can think of ionization as a transition to an orbital with n equal infinity, and so we end up with in wave numbers is that it's plus the Rydberg constant over n squared. That will give us a number in reciprocal centimeters. Of course, in our case, this is for helium. So for n equals 2, and remembering, of course, that we need to include the charge on the nucleus here. Critical thing for these one electron atoms is to choose the charge on the nucleus. For hydrogen, Z equals 1, so we often leave it out. But for helium, we need Z squared in there. So for N equals 2, for helium, our ionization energy in wave numbers is going to be 2 squared times R divided by N squared. So that's 2 squared. So actually, they all cancel out. And so our ionization energy in reciprocal centimeters is going to be equal to RHE. And the value for helium we got above was 109.722 reciprocal centimeters. But remember, the question asked for us to do this in EV. So get all the marks. We've got to turn this into the right units. And so E, we've done this before, is HC times the wave number. So that's 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 times 3 times 10 to the 8 times 109.722. But that's in reciprocal centimetres. To work in standard units of metres, I need a factor of 100. And when I do that, I end up with 2.181 times 10 to the minus 18. And of course, that's in joules. And to convert to EV, I've got to divide by the charge of the electron. So E in EV is going to be 2.181 times 10 to the minus 18 divided by the charge on the electron. So that's 2.181 times 10 to the minus 18 divided by 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19. And when I do that, I get 13.6 EV. So we've just worked out the ionization energy for n equals 2 there. The ionization energy for n equals 3 is going to be z squared. So that's 2 squared times r helium divided by 3 squared. So that's 4 r h e divided by 9. And I could go through exactly the same procedure as we did for n equals 2. 
But in fact, what you can see is for n equals 2, it was r h e. Here we've got four ninths r h e. So that clearly shows us that the ionization energy for n equals 3 is 4 over 9 times the ionization energy for n equals 2. So that's going to be 4 over 9 times 13.6. And when I do that, I get 6.05 eV. So you could have gone through exactly the same procedure here, but just seeing that there's a simple relationship between the two ionization energies gives you an easier way of doing that. Neither is wrong. One way is a little bit quicker, perhaps. We're asked also to comment. Well, what would I say? There's lots of things you could say about this. In fact, 13.60, the ionization energy from N equals 2, in fact, is about equal to the ionization energy of the H atom. Remember, this magic number of 13.6 eV is the ionization energy of the H atom. The other thing that's really straightforward is that the ionization energy for N equals 2 is bigger than the ionization energy for N equals 3. You know that when you go to higher orbitals, the ionization energies get smaller because you're approaching the uh, N equals infinite limit. So anything along those lines that shows you understanding what you calculate is really what's being asked for here. You could notice that going up n equals 2 to n equals 3, n equals 4, the levels get closer and closer together as you approach you know, the n equals infinite limit. Lots of things to note. That's question 2a, all done. Now remember this was either or, you'd either do part a or part b, I'm going to do both. So now we're going to have a go at 2b. So it says, transitions between the 5s1 and the 4p1 configurations are observed in the emission spectrum of the H atom. So we're going to be talking about 5s1 to 4p1. It says determine the term symbols of the states involved in this emission and show you get two lines in the absence of a magnetic field. So 5s1 to 4p1. So let's remind ourselves 5s1 to 4p1 is what we're doing here. Question again says term symbols of the states involved, two lines in the absence of a magnetic field term symbols, 5s1, s is a half, l equals naught, so we've done an s state before, so here j can only be equal a half, so double s one half, 4p1, s equals a half, l equals one, so j goes from l plus s to l minus s, steps of one, none in between there, so double up p three halves, double up p one half, there are term symbols, three states, show that we only get two lines, so let's draw a nice clear energy level diagram here. Our upper state is the 5s1, so we've just got a double s one half state here, and then our lower state, double p three halves, double p one half. And this question, of course, is asking us, do we know the selection rules? Well, remember, delta s is naught, delta l must be plus or minus one, delta j, naught, or plus or minus one. So let's think about what transitions are possible here. So we're going from L equals naught to L equals 1 here. So that's okay. We're in accord with the delta L selection rule. Delta S isn't changing. As we said, one electron never does for the hydrogen atom. So J can stay the same or change by one unit. So that transition is allowed. J goes from a half to three halves. That's a change in one or stay the same. So two transitions, as the question asked us to show. So it says then, if we start thinking about a magnetic field, what factors determine the change in energy of a given MJ level when you apply a magnetic field? So we're asked, again, determine the change in energy of a particular MJ level when we apply a magnetic field. Factors that affect the energy in a magnetic field are B, the size of the field, the actual magnitude of the field. And remember, that's often wrapped up in a constant that we call K to do with the field splittings. It depends on Mj and, of course, Gj. Remember, we had that E Zeeman was proportional to K, which involved the field strength times Gj times Mj. So there's three factors that affect how a given Mj level shifts. So then it says use the formula for Gj to determine Gj for the states involved that we've just been looking at in going from 5s1 to 4p1. So those three states that we calculated back up here, the double at S one half, double at P three halves, double at P one half, we've got to evaluate GJ for those. So I'll do these for, for one of the states. So for the double at S one half, GJ is going to be three times J, which is a half, times J plus one, which is three halves, plus L S, S plus one, minus L, which is naught, times L plus one, 
all over 2 times j, which is a half, times 3 halves. Okay, so that's just sticking numbers in the formula, and when I do that, I come out with a gj value of 2. Now, you should do that for the other ones. Let's just note, though, that when I do that, I get doublet p 1 half, I get 2 thirds, and the doublet p 3 halves, I get 4 thirds. And so the doublet S state splits the most, the doublet P one half the least, and the doublet P three half somewhere in between. But that's going to come a bit later. We've worked out the various values of GJ. Let's just label those up. So let's now look back at part four then. So we've done this. So it says use the selection rule to MJ to show that in a magnetic field the transitions from 5S to 4P, those we've been looking at, consist of 10 lines. So the easiest way to do this, of course, is to draw a nice energy level diagram and apply the relevant selection rules. We know that there were two lines in the absence of a field. Transitions from the 5S, double S, one halves to the two states from the 4P were both allowed. How do those then split in the field? We're doing an energy level diagram here. We're starting up in the 5S. And so, of course, in the field, what we're going to end up with, this is a double S one half state. And so our different values of MJ are minus a half and MJ equals plus a half. Remember, MJ goes from plus J, a half, down in steps of one to minus J. So we've got two states here, which are degenerate without the field, but when you apply the field, they split. So now let's put down our other states. So we're going down, we've got a break in our energy scale here. There's a big gap, of course. Our doublet P three half state is going to split. We're going to split into four there, and we're gonna have MJ is three halves, a half, minus a half, and minus three halves. And I've tried to draw the splittings even here and slightly smaller than the double S one half state because the GJ value is slightly smaller. And then lower in energy, we're going to get a double P one half state. Of course, for the one half, MJ is either a half or minus a half. Here, MJ is three halves, a half, minus a half, minus three halves. And here, MJ is a half or minus a half. And so here in the field, and I'll try and draw this one a little bit smaller to show that this splits the least, we end up with MJ as a half and MJ is minus a half. So there we've drawn how the levels split. We know that none of the splittings are the same, so we don't have any problems with lines overlapping in the spectrum. That's why we had to calculate the GJ values, and in fact, that's the answer to part five. So now let's remember to apply our selections. We know we can go from here to here and here to here. In the absence of a field, we've got two lines, so the only additional selection rule we need to worry about is that delta MJ equals naught or plus or minus one. So now I'm gonna try and draw these in freehand, which is a bit tricky. Let's start by thinking about the double S one half, double P three halves. MJ is a half, so we can go to MJ is three halves there. That's a change of one. We can go to MJ is a half, and we can go to MJ is minus a half, so that we've obeyed the selection rule. We can then do transitions from MJ is minus a half to a half. That's a change of plus one to minus a half, a change of zero, a change of minus one, there. So we've got six lines that we've got there. We can't go from plus a half to minus three halves because that's a change in MJ of two, which is breaking the selection rule. So we can then draw the transitions in to the lower level. Now to the doublet P one half state, MJ is a half to a half is allowed because that's a change of zero. A half to minus a half is allowed, a change of one. Minus a half to a half is allowed, that's a change of one minus a half to minus a half is allowed that's a change of zero we've got four lines so what we've shown there is in the magnetic field we've got 10 lines just by applying the selection rules the last part i've already in fact answered why do we need to calculate gj of course gj is needed to check the state split different amounts so we know no lines overlap in the spectrum and there we are that's all there is to that really very straightforward question just doing a standard zoom in effect